So here we are, the last Sunday of 2021. Can you remember what the end of last year was like? I recall the restrictions were lifted a little and we were allowed to gather in groups of up to eight. And I recall that we were anticipating that the vaccines that would come at the end of uh, in, at the beginning of 2021. And I think we all hoped and prayed that the pandemic would end and life would go back to normal. But instead, like this meme shows, 2021 turned out to be like a twin of 2020. But we learned to adapt to the ever-changing situation. We learned a whole alphabet soup of acronyms, plus some new Greek letters of the alphabet. We learned to press on together. But we also know that these past two years have taken its toll on us. And according to a survey done in October of this year, 7 in 10 Singaporeans found 2021 to be the most stressful year ever. And this was before the Omicron variant created even more chaos and uncertainty around the world. So perhaps many of us approach this year end with mixed feelings. Amidst all the festivities, we carry with us a heavy burden from the past and worries and uncertainties about the future. Perhaps we struggle to know how to truly give thanks at this year-end Thanksgiving service. But the Lord does not leave us alone in this struggle. Today I want to take us through two portions of scripture that show how God's people responded through different seasons of great stress and suffering and how we too can respond likewise. First, let us pray. Heavenly Father, commit to you this time as we gather together in your name. Pray that you would speak to us through your word, minister to us by your spirit. For those who are feeling weary and heavy laden, to come to you to find rest in you. And that we may all be able to end this year, Lord, in a spirit of thanksgiving and rejoicing in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First, I want to share with you an excerpt from a letter from someone who had been under enforced stay-home notice for close to two years. Someone all too familiar with suffering and stress and uncertainties every day. Listen to what he has to say. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If this sounds familiar, it's because it's from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippian church, from chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. And when he wrote this, the Apostle Paul had been under house arrest for close to two years, unable to leave his place of residence. He knew what it meant to have his freedoms restricted. And more than that, he knew what it meant to endure prolonged suffering. Most of his life since coming to know the Lord was marked with danger, persecution, and attacks on him physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Yet, here Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And, as, and just to reinforce this point, in case we think that, 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 that he, said, he, he didn't know what he was saying, he says, I will say it again, rejoice. And he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. Not a harshness that comes when we are highly stressed or, or under duress, but gentleness. For the Lord is near. He is not far from us. He draws near to us. And he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And he gives this promise that if we do this, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. 
with all the suffering that he had gone through, Paul would have had every reason to be bitter or disgruntled against God. Yet he continues to worship and give thanks to the Lord. And now let's look at, an, at something else that's written at another earlier point in the history of God's people from the book of Habakkuk. I won't go into too much detail here because we will be covering Habakkuk in a sermon series later next year. But suffice to say that Habakkuk was written at a low time in the history of God's people. And Habakkuk's prophecy was directed to a world that must have seemed on the edge of disaster. But listen to how he concludes his prophecy in Habakkuk 3, verses 17 to 19. And it's entitled, Habakkuk rejoices in the Lord. Verse 17 says, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. Though Habakkuk is saying, though everything around me seems to be barren, though I don't know how I'm going to even get through the next day, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. So what is the key here to being able to give thanks and to rejoice even in the midst of the most difficult circumstances? The key is, as Paul and Habakkuk both emphasize, to rejoice in the Lord. It means to rejoice in who God is and what he has already done. But what does that mean? What does that look like? And it can seem like a, a lot to grasp. But to help us, I just want to share something that helpful that I picked up from the Calming the Anxious Heart seminar that the church organized earlier this month, where Reverend David Wong uh, shared a simple but very powerful message on three unchanging, unchangeable truths about God, what he called the Trinitarian truth. These truths are like an anchor that holds us steady and a fixed point on the horizon that we can look at in the midst of a stormy sea. These truths are a foundation upon which we can rejoice in the Lord. Even if everything else is taken away from us, these truths will remain. And what are they? The first truth is, God the Father loves us. God the Father loves us. Now, Recently, I was looking at a Christian, Christian spirituality course offered by one of the Bible schools. And I was looking at the outline for this nine-week course. And I was struck by what I saw for the theme for the first three weeks. Week one, God loves you. Week two, God really loves you. Week three, God really, really loves you. And I smiled to myself as I read it because I think it really shows just how hard it is for us to accept that God really loves us, often because of the things we have done or the things that have happened to us. But if you're ever in, a, in danger of forgetting, just look at two of the dates in red in every year's calendar, Christmas and Good Friday. And then recall this well-known verse, For God so loved the world, He loved the world so much, that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16 How did God show His love for us? Romans 5.8 tells us the clearest and most unmistakable way that God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that leads us to the second unchangeable truth. Jesus died for our sins. What is the one thing that should cause us greatest fear and anxiety? It is if our sins were not forgiven if we had no assurance that our sins were forgiven, if God had not provided a way for our sins to be forgiven, we would be spending eternity apart from Him, eternally suffering, 
separated from God, the source of all goodness and love. But as Ephesians 1 verse 7 promises us, in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. In Christ we have the forgiveness of sin. And it doesn't stop there. We have a third truth where Jesus gives us the assurance that the Holy Spirit is with us. He tells his disciples and us in John 14, 26-27, but the Advocate, and another name given is the Counselor or the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. This is the third truth that Jesus, through Jesus we have not only forgiveness of sins but he has given us the Holy Spirit to be with us. So even if circumstances in our lives or everything that's happening around us try to snuff out our joy, we have these unchanging truths to hold on to. God the Father loves us. Jesus died for our sins. And the Holy Spirit is with us. And you know, this brings to mind a devotional on joy that I read recently, where it says, God, the creator of joy, did not place joy out of our reach or make its presence in our lives dependent on our circumstances. Instead, he benevolently created the nature of joy, as well as love, patience, goodness, and all the other fruit of the Spirit, to be a product of our relationship with him. That is why you can see people living in the most amazing seasons of their lives and, and still lack joy while others experience the driest, most painful seasons and somehow remain joyful. The latter have learned how to grow the fruit of joy in their lives through the help of the Holy Spirit. They don't wait for their circumstances to change, telling themselves that they will be happier when they get what they are waiting for, or that joy is unobtainable. They have learned to cultivate joy and therefore enjoy its sweetness during every season of their lives. So joy is not something that is elusive or unobtainable or something that is dependent on our circumstances. Because we know that God loves us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And we know that his Holy Spirit is with us and in us and he will never leave us nor forsake us. We can therefore cultivate joy in any and every season of our life. And that is how we can rejoice in the Lord, the God of our salvation, always. So before we spend some time as part of this year-end Thanksgiving, to spend some time to rejoice in the Lord in reflection and Thanksgiving, I'd like us to listen to this song, The Lord is My Salvation. And as you listen to the words, may the truth therein minister to you. The grace of God has reached for me. Yeah. 
Lord is my salvation. Who is like the Lord of God, strong to of God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea and I am safe on this solid ground. The Lord is my salvation. I will not fear when darkness falls. His strength will help me scale these walls. I'll see the dawn of the rising sun. The Lord is my salvation. Who is like the Lord our God? Strong to save, faithful in love. My debt is paid and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. My hope is hidden in His word, in the Lord. He flowers each promise of His word. When winter fades, I know spring will come. The Lord is my salvation. In times of waiting, times of need, when I know loss, when I am weak, I know His grace will renew these days. The Lord is my salvation. 
Who is like the Lord our God, strong to save, faithful in love? My debt is paid and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. And when I reach my final day, He will not leave me in the grave, but I will rise, He will call me home. The Lord is my salvation. Who is like the Lord our God, strong to save, faithful in love? My debt is paid and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. Glory be to God the Father, and glory be to God the Son, glory be to God the Spirit, the Lord is our salvation. I'd like us to spend some time now to reflect on and to give thanks for the three unchangeable truths that we've learned, that we've heard of who God is and what He has done. God the Father loves us, Jesus died for our sins, and the Holy Spirit is with us. And following that, even as we reflect on the verses from Philippians 4, verses 4 to 7, think about some prayers and petitions and thanksgiving that you can bring before the Lord as we close this year and we move into a new year. And share them among yourselves and in your small groups or wherever you are. And spend time to pray for one another even as we close this year rejoicing in the Lord, the God of our salvation. God bless.